and welcome or welcome back to Tala Talks NICU where we um, go over complicated medical concepts and make them as easy as possible for you to understand. Hopefully this will mean that you will retain the information forever and as many of you have already told us, hopefully it makes you enjoy your time in the NICU more. So today we are going over part three of necrotizing enterocolitis. In the first and second videos, we went over the pathophysiology of neck or what causes neck, um, as well as the prevention of neck. And in video number two, we went over the diagnosis of neck. In this video, we are going to go over the management and treatment of neck. And then in the final video, we'll go over the outcomes after an infant had neck. Let's start with the management of neck. When neck was first described in the 1970s, the authors of that seminal study quite brilliantly described how to treat neck. And honestly, it's pretty much exactly what we still do today, which is a combination of gut rest and supportive care, which if you think about it, is pretty much how we treat every neonate that's really sick in the NICU, whether it's from sepsis or a really bad PDA or HIE, we do gut rest and supportive care. It's interesting that nearly 50 years later, we still don't have a targeted treatment towards neck, whether it's an anti-protein that we can give or a medicine targeted against hormones or something. And a lot of that is because we don't really know exactly what prevents neck, what and exactly what causes neck. So eventually, hopefully with all the research being done, we will have more targeted medications towards neck. So in the words of Dr. Santuli et al, who published that paper in 1976, this is what we do to treat neck. So the first thing is nasogastric decompression. So as soon as we're worried about a baby having neck, we stop feeds or we make them NPO, nothing per os, and we insert a tube either from normally from the mouth to the stomach or sometimes from the nose into the stomach and then we suction on that tube. So what we're trying to do is to pull out all the juices and the secretions and the acidity and everything from the stomach or anything coming up even further down from that, from the bile or whatever, so that the gut can rest as much as possible. So gastric decompression with a suction tubing, basically. The second thing is IV fluid administration. Obviously, when these babies are made NPO, you need a way to support them from a fluid and a nutrition standpoint. So ideally, you want a pick line. Go watch that video on the peripherally placed central catheters. So um, most of these babies are over a week or 10 days old. Again, go back and watch the other couple of videos. And so they're really past the window of getting the umbilical catheters placed. So in the vast majority of babies with neck, we end up placing a pick line. If we are unable to get a pick line, then sometimes a central line needs to be placed surgically or something that we call a broviac. This is obviously more invasive, but we do need a very solid concrete way to be able to give babies IV fluids as well as medications. And as you all know, when we're not feeding a baby, we want to give the best possible nutrition that we can. And that is normally TPN or total parenteral nutrition. The third thing is, is we have to pay close attention to the acid base balance. So yes, we are getting frequent labs um, as well as frequent gases to make sure that everything is as balanced as it can be and we can make changes very rapidly as the neck progresses. The fourth thing is broad spectrum antibiotics parenterally, which means in the IV. So this is always a question in the units and it's a topic of a lot of debate, which antibiotics to give. Many units will give ampicillin and gentamicin and if the baby already had an IV line, then maybe they would do nafcicillin or vancomycin instead of ampicillin because you are wanting at that point to cover for a staph aureus, which um, generally staph aureus is resistant to ampicillin. Remember, if you are on vancomycin and gentamicin for neck, you better be following those levels very carefully because they are both renally excreted and with worsening renal function in neck, it's very easy for those levels to get to toxic values. So if you are on vanc and gent or either of them, make sure that you're following those levels carefully in neck. Then there's always the conversation about adding anaerobic coverage. And the reason for that is that a lot of the bacteria in the gut are anaerobes. 
So pretty consistently, if a baby does have a perforation or it is a surgical neck, then generally we will add anaerobic coverage. There isn't really a lot of evidence either way, but this could mean adding a drug like clindamycin or metronidazole, which is flagyl, to the antibiotics that you're already on, since they both cover anaerobes. Or it could be just switching all of your antibiotics to something kind of more broad spectrum, like a meropenem or a zosin, which is piperacillin and tazobactam, which both have like a coverage of gram positives, gram negatives and anaerobes. Then the question is, how long should we treat babies with antibiotics? If the blood culture is positive, which is about in 20% of the time, then generally that will guide the length of treatment. Some people use normalization of the CRP uh, to guide the treatment for how long the baby should be on antibiotics. But if you think about it, then a lot of times a baby could be very well ready to eat, x-rays look completely normal, but the CRP may still be a little bit elevated. We used to treat neck for longer periods, really up to 14 days. Now, most people will treat neck for somewhere between seven to 10 days, depending on the clinical status. A recent study published showed that the outcomes of neck didn't really change depending on which antibiotics were used. So really, logically, what we should all be doing is using the most narrow spectrum antibiotics that we can for as short as period as possible. And then finally, they said that we also have to get serial x-ray studies or Rwentigan graphics. I'm not really sure how to pronounce that word, um, which does mean serial x-ray studies. They suggested initially at least every four to six hours. So as we'll talk about a little bit more, you really want to get the x-rays for two reasons, either to see whether the neck is getting worse and whether you are going to need surgery or you also want to show that the neck might be getting better. So the pneumatosis goes and the bowels are all moving around. So you may start the KUBs every four to six hours, but then you're more likely to stretch that out to maybe Q12 hours, eventually Q24 hours. And then maybe um, you'll not get an x-ray for a few days and then get a KUB on the day that you're thinking of starting feeds again. So yes, serial KUBs. So that brings us to our first question, which is when does an infant need surgery for neck? So the first really obvious answer is when there is a pneumoperitoneum. So when you see free air in the gut, that by definition means that the gut got so sick in an area that it actually died and got a little hole in it. So it allowed, or a perforation, so it allowed air from inside the intestine to get out into the peritoneal cavity. So by definition, if we see air in the peritoneal cavity, it means that there is a perforation somewhere in the intestine, and generally that needs to be fixed surgically. When you don't have a pneumoperitoneum, it is always really tricky to make the decision about whether a baby needs surgery or not. There are some instances where you don't have clear gas in the belly, where the baby still definitely does have dead gut in there. Sometimes the entire KUB could just look really gray and gasless, so you don't see any bowel loops at all. Sometimes you may see just this like really thick bowel loop somewhere which is not moving along at all. That could just mean that that actual loop of bowel is dead and does need to be surgically excised. Sometimes the x-ray is kind of neither here or there, but you'll see, for example, the really red, almost cellulitis look of peritonitis on the abdominal wall. Um, all of those things in combination with worsening labs and a worsening clinical picture. So like we keep saying, the baby is just persistently acidotic, hyperkalemic. The baby is becoming more hypertensive and whatever you're doing doesn't seem to help. Then that in combination with a gray gasless abdomen or a thickened bowel loop may also indicate that the baby needs surgery. This is when you sit down with your team as well as your surgical colleagues and you all decide whether now is the time for them to go in or not. Now, the other problem is, even if you decide that a baby definitely does need surgery, is which surgical intervention should be done. And there are basically two options. The first technique is when the surgeon performs an exploratory laparotomy. So they are basically cutting open the belly and going in to explore to see what's really going on with the gut. If he or she sees any dead segments of gut, then they will cut them out. 
In most of the cases, if any of the GOT needs to be actually sectioned out, then they'll bring up the remaining loop of GOT to the skin surface basically and create an ostomy. So until the rest of the gut heals, the baby would effectively be pooping, depending on how high up the um, intestines it is, out of the ostomy site. Then two to three months later, depending on how well the baby is doing and how healthy we assume the gut is at that point, the surgeon will go back in and then reconnect the ostomy with the remainder of the gut. The second option is when the surgeon just puts in a peritoneal drain. So this is kind of like a yellow, thick, flexible tube. It looks like just like a really flat, large straw that the surgeon would poke through the skin into the peritoneal cavity. This gives a chance for all the inflammatory proteins as well as the meconium as well as all of the gunk that's lying around in the peritoneal cavity to drain outside the belly, hoping that then the gut will slowly heal by itself. Placing a drain sounds like a fantastic idea on paper because obviously every baby, especially those micro preemie babies that might already be really sick, would generally tolerate placing a drain a lot better than an entire surgical procedure. But really there's two issues with placing a drain and this is discussed extensively in literature. What's better for babies? So the first issue is, is that because you're not just magically getting rid of the sick gut, that even if the intestine does end up healing itself, the whole course could be protracted a lot longer. So you end up with all the inflammatory cytokines and proteins circulating around the body for a lot longer, arguably, than if just an x lap was done. So this would translate potentially to a worse neurodevelopmental outcome. We never want loads of inflammatory markers just circulating around the body. The second issue is, is that sometimes if it's just kind of a small hole, then the intestine would end up healing itself. But a lot of times there really is dead gut in there that actually does need to be removed. So a lot of the times that the babies end up getting a peritoneal drain placed, you're just kind of buying a few days and a lot of them end up needing surgery anyway. A large recent study was done comparing these two different approaches in babies with neck. So the x lap versus the placement of a peritoneal drain. And once again, we didn't really get a clear cut answer of what would be better for these babies. Basically, if a tiny baby needs a surgical intervention, then the death or neurodevelopmental outcomes are very bad anyway. As an aside, a lot of those babies in the study that did have the drain placed ended up needing surgical intervention anyway. But in that study, at least, there wasn't a clear cut answer over which one is preferable. Just as an aside, and this is something that surgeons do sometime, sometimes they'll go in for an x lap and they will see some gut which is obviously dead. I mean, it will look white at that point and they will definitely excise those areas of gut. But some areas of the gut might look very, very sick, but they still have the potential to heal or not. In those cases, the surgeon may just close up the belly again and then go in a few days later for a second look just to see whether there is now more dead gut or any pieces of those gut were able to heal. And so what should you do to support all the other systems? So remember, while the baby is NPO with a repogal to suction, getting antibiotics and IV fluids, you should also be treating the rest of the body as well. Very often you have to end up giving the baby more respiratory support. If they're apneic, obviously, then they may need intubation. Even if they're just on CPAP at baseline, you may not want all that extra air blown directly into their belly. So you may want to intubate them for that anyway. Babies frequently will need blood pressure medications or inotropes to keep the blood pressure up. And they also very often need blood transfusions, whether this is just packed red blood cells to help with carrying the oxygen around the body, whether it's platelets. And as we talked about, really most babies with neck end up with some level of thrombocytopenia or whether it is cryoprecipitate or plasma because the baby actually has active bleeding issues. Then really, as you're doing all of this, ridiculously, you just sit there and hope that this baby is going to heal. So you're really just supporting the baby and hoping that the gut will slowly get better and the baby will continue to get better.
However, as we've already said, in about 20% of times, the baby will pass away from necrotizing enterocolitis. Sometimes this is from just an overwhelming hypotensive type shock. Other times it's from neck totalis, where really most of the gut has died and the baby can't survive, obviously, without any gut. So when do we stop treatment? Again, nobody's really sure about this, like we said earlier. We definitely used to treat a little bit longer, maybe 10 to 14 days. Now we've all realized that if the baby is doing well clinically, then maybe we can afford to start feeds a little bit earlier and stop antibiotics a little bit sooner. Obviously, this will really depend on the clinical picture. If the x-ray still looks funny or the baby still has green drainage from suction or still having bloody stools, obviously, we're not going to start feeding the baby. But if everything is corrected, then we may be able to start trophic feeds even at day five after the baby was diagnosed with neck, even if we are continuing the antibiotics a little bit longer. To summarize all these treatment strategies, the paper published in the New England Journal by doctors Walker and New about 10 years ago now kind of summed up what, how each stage of neck should be treated. And you can look through this figure by yourselves, um, but basically it kind of goes through the rule out neck, the definitive neck, and then the surgical neck. This paper, like we said, was published 10 years ago. Probably the thing that's changed the most in the last 10 years is that we don't always necessarily treat as long. So it might not be the full 10 days. It might not even be the full seven days. The other thing that we're all kind of still divided on is whether we really should ever be placing a peritoneal drain or not. Well, that was it. I hope that you learned something today on the treatment of neck. I would be, or we all would be, absolutely fascinated to know what you do in your NICU. So if you've reached this far, I would really love to know which antibiotics you use and how long you treat for, and whether you are using peritoneal drains or um, laparotomies in your unit. Um, in the meantime, please remember to like and subscribe and let us know below what you would like us to talk about next. Thank you.